life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. All three at once. How are you going to handle it? I am Marshall. I'm Lainey. I am Corey. And together we are... Facing Zombies? And basically we are starting a new podcast segment that is going through all of the Walking Dead episodes until it ends. And we thought this was a really good time to do this because we're nearing on the final 11th season of The Walking Dead. So by the time we finish all of these episodes, we should be caught up and everybody can be more uh, wise, knowledgeable about mm-hmm. the series. So our little bit of our bona fides with The Walking Dead, I started it when it first came out. I wasn't sure if these two would enjoy it we're not really a horror genre group we're not it's not our favorite thing but it was so well written do you remember how you came into it laney was it not i think people at work were talking about it yeah she usually gets peer pressure at work to watch stuff like game of thrones and then walking dead so that's how she got into it. I think I might have seen the whole first season before either of them. I'm, and, but, I'm pretty certain that one of the things that got her into it was Andrew Lincoln. Love Actually. Yeah, that was the only really connection was, was mm-hmm. Love Actually. But this Sunday tradition is what it really became for us. It was something we looked forward to, something we endured, because this show is an emotional like gauntlet. Uh, to go through, but it was definitely something that became almost like a ritual, really, for us. And we went all the way through up until recently. We kind of dropped off a little bit, but now uh, Lainey and I are back and committed and season, just finished season 10. So the original series began October 31st of 2010, which kind of takes me aback. It was Halloween. It was almost 11 years ago that it it started. I think 2010 was kind of an interesting year for our family because that was the year that Corey and I moved to Florida and we started a brand new jobs. And it was just kind of, it was kind of like a milestone year, right? 2010. So to think that this show started way back then is kind of a little mind blowing to me. Yeah, it really is a milestone, like kind of a landmark in our in our personal journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and watching the show is kind of a parallel of that in a way where people go through stuff. Because we had gone through some stuff at the time, for sure. So how we're going to work this is we are going to go through the episode. We're going to share some Easter eggs, some hidden things that we have seen. We've done some research on, lots of deep dives into things that are interesting in the show. I personally watch the show with my finger on the pause button, looking at everything in the background, and you're going to see a lot of that, especially in this episode. Yeah. The, one of the things I wanted to start with was the intro. So there are a couple things about the intro and the show in general that I find interesting, so we're going to share that with you. The first one is that the title cards decay more and more each season. So if you look at this season, you know, it's it's just your basic, a, a little bit decayed title. But then as you continue to go on, the titles get more and more and more decayed. But what's really funny is if you watch Fear the Walking Dead season one, it has the clearest titles because it's the first of the chronologically... Pre, it's a prequel in a sense. To right. The, the yeah. The Walking Dead. Exactly. One other thing that's interesting is that The Walking Dead has never mentioned the word zombies. They're called walkers, biters, creepers, dead ones, geeks. That's the one that they use a lot in in the first season. Yeah. But if you watch the captioning on Netflix, they do call them zombies. Hmm. So there is that. They never actually st- say zombies, but they'll say things in the captioning like zombies growling or something like that. So in the description, they're, they refer to as zombies. Yeah. Correct. And also, as we know, every season, the intro does change. It gives you little insights as to what is happening in each season. So I have what I have seen in season one's intro, and later on I will be telling you where I saw that and maybe how it changes a little bit 
as we go through season one. So here are the series of images. As I was able to discern them, there are a couple that are really dark. So I couldn't totally tell what they were, but I did a guess. So we have a shot with some barbed wire. We have a doorknob turning. An empty room looks kind of like it's in a hospital somewhere, but I can't tell, maybe it's a basement. We have a picture of Rick in the Atlanta Telegraph that says officer shot. An empty grocery store. Shane in a broken picture. Lori in a broken picture. A farmhouse. Dale's RV. An abandoned teddy bear. A water tower. Some random streets of Atlanta. This very large building with a satellite dish that's in Atlanta. A hospital hallway. A street with a lot of papers on it. The Kings County Sheriff Building. Train tracks. A street with a bus. A crow eating what looks like a cat. Phone lines. And the scene of the highway to Atlanta with the cars that are trying to leave Atlanta. So one side's empty and one side is full. Mm -hmm. So those are all the things that we are probably going to see in season one in one form or another. It's I've a already... longer list than Ozark where they give you like four images. Right, exactly. I've already picked out like a couple of them that seem like they're kind of random, but they show up right here in this episode. They do. And I think the only ones that don't totally show up even though they kind of do is the picture of Shane and the picture of Lori how they are broken because as we will find out later there aren't really broken pictures in in the house that you see yeah. in Rick's house so I think that was just kind of like a projection of these broken relationships yeah, but we'll go a little more into yeah. that later yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah and we'll go into pictures when we get to the comics as well so let's dive right into the actual episode. Uh, the first scene is we open where Rick is looking for gas and he finds a walker child. And this scene to me was one of those that we had to kind of look at and see when exactly this happens. We know it'll happen after Rick leaves the police station uh, chronologically, but that also doesn't make sense to me because he's looking for gas at a later part in the episode where the car dies and he has to leave it. So where does this happen? Where does this scene happen in our episode? That's a good question. Uh, I, I feel like it's it's kind of a continuation of that scene. When I first saw it, I thought that this was like some sort of dream sequence. Mm -hmm. And it was hearkening forward what was about to happen especially right. given this little child character that we see with the bear mm -hmm. i thought that that was actually supposed to be foreshadowing of another thing that's coming up so he so. so somehow overheard stuff in this coma that manifested itself as a dream with a little girl getting shot possibly and you know that i don't think that's the same teddy bear that Carol's daughter has no, because but it's uh, it's at least giving you that concept. It's making you look forward to that, right? I think it serves the purpose of just showing you how far the show's going from a production standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like buckle your seatbelts because we're going there. But as far as the timeline goes, I'm not sure. Yeah. So speaking of the teddy bear, that is the first instance of something from the intro where the little girl has a teddy bear and when she gets shot, she drops the teddy bear and there it's on the ground. Some other things to note in this scene is that Rick's sheriff car is number 134, which I actually used to track later on to make sure that it really was his car and that he did in fact pick it up from the police station. Also as a side note, diesel fuel is 2.99, so that's cool. I think the funniest thing in this episode, and Marshall and I spent quite some time on this, is that in one of the scenes, he comes across this like tow truck for a wrecker service that is owned by Jack Pendley. And we were like, well, is this like a fake name or what? So we did a very big deep dive and we used the phone number that's on the truck. Mm -hmm. And this is actually for a Jack Pendley wrecker service. And it's for Douglasville Auto and Wrecker in Douglasville, Georgia. And yes, that is his real office number on that truck. Which makes you wonder how many phone calls he got from Right. <laughs> but the other thing that we noticed is that his wrecker service has an employee number of one. Mm -hmm. That means Jack Penley is the only person working for the service and his truck is abandoned. Sorry, Jack, you didn't make it. Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> poor Jack. <laughs> poor Jack. So I wanted to include a little bit of a segment here. You you might have seen the previous video or audio that I did with Jose where we were learning about how to survive in a zombie apocalypse from various forms of media and I'm going to talk today about what you can learn in days gone by and what they got right and what they didn't get right. And so when we begin this episode Rick is running around looking for gas. This is going to be your first problem. Uh, you may not know this but gasoline goes bad. We never notice it because we use it so quickly, but gasoline starts to go bad anywhere between 30 days and eight months after it's produced. And that's kind of based off of how it's stored and how they add stabilizers to it. And how quickly you can get gas out of a gas station, we've actually watched it happen. In March 2012, fuel delivery men in the UK went on strike and all the gas stations ran out of gas in two days. Mm -hmm. because everybody was panicking. So by the point that Rick wakes up, all of the gas is now beginning to decay. That is in every car, in every gas station. It is in its route to being unusable. And some people will be like, well, why don't they now run on ethanol? But that's got its own problems because only certain cars can run entirely on ethanol and it takes more ethanol to get the same amount of energy. It's very bad fuel efficiency. So you can, if you can make a whole lot of it, sure. But unfortunately, it takes lots and lots of corn and other kinds of plant products to make ethanol. So it's not a very efficient system. So seeing Daryl get gas for his bike eight years, nine years it's after the apocalypse is not happening okay no i'm pretty certain that it just runs on rule of cool what if it runs on moonshine it well people have attempted that and cars can run on some alcohols that's a, basically what ethanol is but again it's not a very efficient method you're going to be using a lot of it and you're actually probably going to be damaging the engine diesel engines will do the best for some of these forms of alternative fuel but this also comes with another problem and that is power stations and power in the world. We can see that there is no electricity anywhere in Kings County here. And that's also very accurate because within about a week, all power systems are going to completely shut down. Nuclear power plants actually have a dead man switch. If nobody implants any information into this thing at any point, it shuts down in 20 minutes. A gas plant, if it's not shut down manually within a couple of days, could start having explosions and then will start burning up. So are you saying that like in this season, uh, the season one right now in season 10, they have a lot of like solar panels and things like that is that a better option than what you're seeing or even like well a generator would run on gas so probably not a generator but the well, solar power well and that's the thing is generators run the electricity grid so that's why they they would fail like he's saying yeah if you're looking to go and prepare and make sure that you have power in the future for any kind of apocalypse you want to start investing in solar panels right now because solar panels while they do wear out over time they're going to last longer than a lot of the electrical grid you actually want to be able to run your electricity completely separate from the grid furthermore there's another error here all of our water purification and pumping and sewage plants that we have run on electricity from the grid they have their own backup power supplies, but those will typically not last as long. So as soon as that power grid goes down, you're not going to have water for too much longer. You're not going to have a natural gas to your houses much longer. We see that Morgan says the gas is out, but the water seems to run just fine. That's probably because Atlanta and some other places like that, they do have a lot of well water yeah, available to them. Parts of it. Yeah. yeah. So again, you might want to, especially if you are away from major urban centers, invest in a well-based system of your own to have water. Because otherwise, you're going to be collecting it from the rain. In our next scene, we uh, then see Shane and Rick eating burgers in the police car yes still number 134 so continuity good job so a couple things that i noticed in this thing is it's 
bizarre. First off, when they're eating, Shane dips his french fries in the ketchup that's inside Rick's burger. Why? Because they're that close? Yeah, they're, they're really close, or Shane's a jerk. Well, we kind of already know this because Shane begins this big, di- like, chauvinistic diatribe of, like, the, the women that he's with. And honestly, he's a little bit of a pervy creep, in my opinion. And I am a little disappointed in Rick that Rick's just like, hey, 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 it's okay. You can keep talking about women that way. And not really, like, stand up and be like, you know, that's not appropriate. Well, I think it's their dynamic is really important and they had to really start Rick off in a point of submission in a Mm -hmm. lot of ways Mm -hmm. he's a good cop he's not he's not a bad cop obviously he gets ultimately shot in the line of duty but their dynamic is obviously Shane's the alpha anyone (laughs) that could stick their fries in your burger for the ketchup that's an alpha move yeah, yeah, for sure. So then we notice that Rick and Shane work for the Kings County Sheriff Department in Georgia. And Kings County is actually a fictional county, but it is named after Stephen King, who is apparently good friends with showrunner Frank Darabont. Mm-hmm. So that is the King connection there. There's actually another deeper King's connection that I told Lainey about. A cool little side note. Stephen King has offered this to film students for for years. If you're a film student and you want to adapt one of his books, all you have to do is send him a dollar. So they're called Stephen King's Dollar Babies. Uh And Frank Darabont was one of those film students. So Frank Darabont, if you don't know the name, he directed Shawshank Redemption, which is a Stephen King story. And The Green Mile, which is another Stephen Mm. King story. So there's, it goes, Stephen Mm. King goes deep. Therefore, the gratitude of putting King's name in the, the show. Gotcha. So then once they are done complaining about women in general, they get a call that there is a high-speed chase and some criminals in a car. Side note, the license plate is MG96234. I have no connection for that. I just thought it was interesting. So then they get into this high-speed chase, and as they're going, they pass by a crow eating a cat. So there's that part from the intro. The bumper stickers on the car that they are chasing say the judge and there's three of them and they're in different places of the car but they all say the same thing. There's like one on the side front, one on the back, and then one on the closer to the window on the right hand side. I was able to find a Die Cats Metal model car that's a 1971 Pontiac GTO Judge. It is the car that they're chasing and it has, I can see the bumper sticker that says the judge. So it's the make of the car. And it just, instead of like having a little metal name for the make and model, it has a big sticker. Apparently when you buy the car, it's like buying an Apple product and you get a bunch of stickers with it. (laughs) Is that what they mean by sticker price? I don't know. (laughs) So anyway, going through this scene after they are able to stop the car with that little strip of things that puncture your tires, the car flips and there are three guys with guns who hop out and end up shooting Rick twice, once which his vest catches and once in the back so that it actually pierces him, and that's why he winds up in the hospital. There was one thing that I saw that there's a little continuity error in that we definitely saw him get shot in the shoulder, but in another shot, the, the second shot, is he's bleeding from another spot. Right. But that's probably because it went, it went through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the second shot was the back. It took a chunk out of him, basically. Yeah. So then Rick starts to wake up a little bit in the hospital. He thinks he sees Shane talking to him, giving him flowers, which he did, but he's in such a daze that he can't really decipher if it's real or not. So he wakes up, thinks he's talking to Shane, realizes the flowers are dead and that he's been here for a while. Mm -hmm. I hate that, by the way, just as a point of production, I hate when they do that kind of groggy camera work, whatever the effect is. TV has done it really poorly, and that was one of the cases that it looked really bad. Mm-hmm. I think it almost could have been served by just a black screen and the audio. I think yeah. that would have been interesting. Right? Yeah, blur, yeah. Blur, blur, blur the lens a little bit would be fine, but all of this, like, yeah, it's too much. Yeah. 
So he is trying to get up out of the hospital bed. And my first question is, how does he not have a catheter? Right? There's a, there's a lot of things going on here that don't make sense. I how he's honestly alive. think that they probably, as far as what they could get away with violence-wise, they probably later on were doing so much more violent things that watching him pull a catheter out might have been too much for the... Uh, Standards and practices of TV. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you guys are right. He definitely would have had one. Well, also, let's bring up that just how long this hospital has been out. We can see that all of his equipment has been turned off. But according to not only sources outside the show, but inside the show, the zombie apocalypse happened about a month before he woke up. And after the zombie apocalypse happened... About a week later, the hospital shut down. So he has been in there for at least three weeks with no food, no water. No, he has nutrients through his, his IV bag. Yeah. But that bag is not going to last for three weeks. They they have to change those things out right. rather frequently. Mm. Well, I think what's something that's interesting, they won't do it now in any episode because Rick is no, no longer on the show. But to see the last days of that hospital would have been an interesting flashback yeah. because obviously some people got away. Mm -hmm. They abandoned him there, which is understandable if they can't sustain him in his coma. Right. But they, they at least blocked those people off and protected him as best as they could. So suspending belief aside, he stumbles into the hospital hallway. That is also from the intro. And if you were paying attention to the clocks in the hospital and Rick's room, you will see that they have stopped at 2.17. Now, the clocks on the show sometimes reveal what season an episode is taking place, and the special effects and makeup artists admitted that every episode that we shoot, we adjust the time on the watches and the clocks to whatever episode it is we're shooting. So... I get that, but they obviously didn't do it in the first episode because no. it says 2.17 and we're in 1.1. One, one. Yeah. So I, I, that's a really good note for us moving on that that is something we could be looking out for so that mm. we can see what time it is. So. It makes sense. That in pilot, they're just really doing all the work to get everything started so right. they haven't started memes. And but I will say that it was cool that they did have the clocks all stop on the same time in the hospital. There was that attention to detail that the one in his room and the one in the main like area where the nurse's station is were set at the same time. I did I did clock that. Ha <laughs> ha. Mm. So then he stumbles onto the very iconic doors. Don't dead open inside. Yes. Just kidding. <laughs> and of course, there are all the walkers that are trying to get out the door. This very nicely manicured hand kind of peeks itself around there. And then he goes downstairs and he finds all these bodies that are lined up in the streets on the back side of the, the loading dock for the hospital. And then he f stumbles across some helicopters and some military vehicles. What those are... They are emblazoned with the insignia of the 7th Cavalry. This is the division that General George Custer led into a slaughter during the 19th century and an indication that history repeated itself outside the hospital. Ironic, ironic very ironic. Yeah. So now Rick is trying to go see his family. So he stumbles into his house. I think it's really funny that he finds this bicycle and he sees the walker without the legs that's like crawling along the ground and he's kind of a little shocked at first but then he's like nah and then he just keeps going <laughs> it's almost like it should phase him I mean it does phase him a little he's like what the heck is that thing but on the other hand he's just kind of like it's it's not worth my time just well, keep going well yeah I mean number one is half a zombie so when you see half a zombie on your road, then you can be shocked, but move along because it's no threat to you. Right, but at this point, he doesn't even know zombie. Yeah, it's more, yeah. I think he's more stunned and in shock about what's happening. So I don't think that he was like, disregard. I think he was just like, okay, what the hell's going on? I think also he's just like, I've got better things to do with my time. Right. Yeah. It made me giggle a little bit. Yeah. So he gets... <laughs> He gets to his house, and we get our first instance of him going, Coral! 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 <laughs> Which I think is him trying to keep his British accent at bay. Yeah. 
with trying to keep his American accent. So. The thing about if you ever wondered about people who are British being able to manage a American or in this case a Southern American accent, they're actually really adept at it because they get more of our content than we do of theirs. So he's able to do that. So the, they have to lean into the hard R's, which he definitely does when he says Carl. Coral. So then he, you know, has a cry fest and goes outside where I noticed that the numbers of his house are 817. I don't know if that comes up anywhere later, but Rick lives at 817. So he sits down and you see this shadow coming up behind him who hits him in the head with a shuttle. Shuttle? Shovel. A shovel, yes. <laughs> and Rick says, Carl, I found you. Now, we understand what that means, right? Because he thinks, small child, he thinks he's found Carl. But if you think ahead, if you have seen most of Walking Dead, to the episode that is Rick Grimes' last episode, and he's blowing up the bridge, he says, I found you in that episode also, which is a callback to this episode. Mm. We'll talk about that more when we get into that season but I thought that was interesting because I hadn't remembered that that's what he said in either time so then he wakes up again he is tied to a bedpost in Morgan's house which number one wow (laughs) number two did they not read his medical bracelet that he's wearing from the hospital doesn't it usually say what you have been checked in for on your medical bracelet did he still have it on he him? did i checked so yeah mm-hmm. and to, just to be technical this is a house that morgan is occupying it's not more right yeah. right they have that whole conversation where rick says this belonged to these people and etc when they finally decide that they are going to trust him i kind of did a little bit of looking at what was happening in the living room of the house there is a huge stockpile of toilet paper and other paper products in the corner, <laughs> which, of course, I keep thinking, yay, COVID. Um, <laughs> somebody learned. They're cooking with sterno cans and candles because there is no power. So also very smart. But then comes where they kind of start looking at the zombies outside the window and they see Mama Zombie. That's what I'm going to call her, Mama Zombie. Who comes up to the door and starts turning the knob. Also, from the intro. There you go. That's the one I was thinking of. But she's turning the knob. So, in this first episode, comes a problem, which I'm also going to talk about, I think, in the second or third episode. Mm -hmm. That they have smart zombies in in this season. They don't do this in any of the other seasons. They don't do this in Fear the Walking Dead. But Robert Kirkman has addressed this intelligent zombie discrepancy where the, you know, mama can know that she goes to the door and actually turn the knob or later on when zombies are literally climbing a fence in a very fast manner to get to people. Okay. He claims that some newly turned zombies, particularly during the early days of the apocalypse, subconsciously clung on to their own habits, explaining why a young child might hold their favorite toy or a zombie might try and enter their home. This doesn't really explain anything about why in Fear to... the Walking Dead they didn't do this. I yeah, I don't I can't speak to a fear because I've only watched maybe one season of it. But if you think about it, what Mama Zombie is doing is not in her brain it's in her muscles Mm -hmm. it's muscle memory so i buy it in that one instance that she how many times does she it's not their house so why would she know that that's true your fair point i wasn't thinking that i was thinking it was their house but and if if she could then open the door by muscle memory at a house that isn't hers then any zombie could open any door that is true maybe do zombies have a sense of smell or do they yes. only detect things by hearing? It's smell. That's why later well, on they have to put them... Then she smells her family and she's trying to... And that could be it. That yeah. is a fair point. But all around, I'm glad they dropped that. Because number one, who doesn't want to see a zombie just kind of run himself into a fence like... That's hilarious. It's more fun. And for those hardcore critics of... I, 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 You don't have to go far on the internet to find people that just have no tolerance for anything that isn't perfect mm-hmm. uh, that they watch. Um, those people have never made a television show that's on a network because the way Shonda Rhimes describes it is laying track 
in front of a moving train. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if they, you got to give a little bit of grace for this was an ambitious show on a not big network. AMC is not a giant network. It's not. It's not HBO. If this were on HBO, that they, they would have probably had a lot bigger budget and been able to do a lot more in the, in the beginning. But no, this is even Game of Thrones had a learning, learning curve. So I'm um, choosing to look at these early intelligent zombies rather than being like a part of the system. They're outliers. They're strange ones. They're mm-hmm. mutant zombies. Right. We can look at it that Misfiring way. Firing neurons or whatever. Yeah. Right. And in our next scene, now that everything has been explained and they have a little bit more of a chance to rest, Rick takes Morgan and Dwayne to his house and the police station. Morgan is the first smart survivor we encounter in this mm-hmm. series. So it is interesting that this early on, we see Shane, but we don't see Shane in the apocalypse at this point. Right. So he's going to be the next one that's really dominant. He's a jerk. But he's very knowledgeable about how to survive. But Morgan is the first one we see, and at least he's a decent dude. I have to also say, thank you for bringing that up, that Morgan is one of my favorite characters. Yep. Especially when he goes over into Fear the Walking Dead. I feel like the, when his arrival to Fear is what made that show revive itself. It was like good for maybe a season, and then it started to kind of be wishy-washy, and then Morgan arrives, and you're like... Yes. <laughs> this is what we Before want to Before he the gets show. there, he becomes a Jedi, and then, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, which almost makes him, an, he's a different version of the moral center. He's the only moral center that nobody can seem to kill. Correct. But that's another show. That is another show. So what happens is Rick finds Baseball Bat, which is kind of funny and foreshadowing to yeah. me if we talk about, like, you know, the whole Negan baseball bat aspect. And he also finds some PPE, you know, a little visor with plastic. Again, I'm laughing because of the uh, COVID connection. But also, he seems to really like this PPE thing because he seems to find it in other places. And we'll talk about that when we come a couple episodes up. So they go to his house and they have this whole discussion about how the women like to grab photo albums instead of survival gear. And that both Laurie and Morgan's wife did that. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on that conversation? It's interesting that the whole woman, what women are coming from a male perspective is a, is a theme in this episode. Because mm-hmm. it came from Shane and then it came from, it came from Rick. From Morgan, yeah. Yeah, Morgan. I, I, I don't think that that's going to necessarily be the case, personally. I feel like you're going to find in a real world scenario, a lot more women will be packing things that men won't think of for apocalypse survival mm-hmm. that will be quality of life, but necessary quality of life right. items. I would say yes and. I, I yeah. can see women still grabbing photos, but also you don't want to get in in between Mama Bear and her cubs, you know. So there will exactly. be. A- I most certainly would not see them pulling what Lori pulled and literally take every family photo with her. Right. I think taking some definitely, but you are right. I think women versus men, men are very like goal focus oriented. I'm not saying the women aren't, yeah. but I'm saying that men are very goal focus oriented where their first priority is to say, let's get food, let's get weapons, let's get you out. Yeah. Whereas the women are like, mm, no, let's get stuff that are sentimental those things that will help me emotionally, whereas everything else will help me physically, that is kind of an interesting dynamic, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Fun fact, when Rick goes to get the keys to the car, he opens the cabinet and there's like all these hooks with all these keys. There are no keys gone. All the keys are there. There isn't a hook that is empty before he takes the key. So that got me wondering, did they take Shane's car? Yes. I think later on they do say that Shane got them out, but got Lori and Carl out. But I thought that was weird because wouldn't they at least take some house keys and lock the house up if they're going to leave? Well, as we see in Fear, that zombie apocalypse happened fast. So they may have been having to run for it. Yeah. I don't buy that. I don't necessarily either. It's it's automatic. You close the door and you lock it. It's like two seconds of a decision. Especially I, while you've got the protection of another person there. It's not that long to lock up the house. Yes. 
Plus looting. Like, if you, if you really want to think about it, you know looting's going to happen. You lock up your house. That doesn't mean that people aren't going to break a window, but you should still lock up your house. Yeah. They go to the police station, and they take hot showers, and they are so excited, and Dwayne's doing a little dance, yeah, a little song. So cute. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was fun. And then they find the gun armory. Rick does a quote here, which I think is my favorite from the episode, which is, you pull the trigger, you have to mean it. Always remember that, Dwayne. So let's talk about this this quote, because I feel like it's very applicable right now. Rick mm-hmm. is a police officer. And he's talking to a little a boy of color, and they're talking about guns. So how how do you feel about this quote? Ten years ago, when we're not saying that you know police shootings didn't happen ten years ago, but we are so much more aware about them right now. What what do you take from this quote? Well, it's crazy. I was actually talking to a friend about a lot of the indictments that have been happening right now with the police shootings. I said to him. I have no idea what it's like to grow up as an African-American. I don't, you know, I didn't, my parents didn't have to tell me, like, be careful if you get pulled over, be respectful, keep your hands in view, all of these things. So it's interesting to to, to have a cop instructing a kid how to shoot a gun. Mm -hmm. What kind of cop do you think that Rick was? I, I have a good feeling based off of the way that he is instructing Dwayne in gun safety that he would not be one of these people that just kind of whips out his gun and shoots. Because he's saying when you use this gun, use it with intention and never put your finger on the trigger. You have to you have to know what you're doing and think about it. And that is where a lot of the problem is. There was actually an instance you guys might not have heard of where I was nearly shot by a police officer. Mm -hmm. But they were well trained. It was an instance where I was cleaning a restroom and they went into the restroom and wasn't expecting me there. And I I said, hi. They had their hand on their gun and they're like, oh, I almost shot you. But they never pulled that gun out of the Mm -hmm. holster. They're that well trained. So, I actually see Shane as being a character. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> Shane is the kind of guy who would shoot first, ask questions later, yeah, and realize strong. he shot the wrong person. I don't think he... I don't... I, I kind of disagree. I think he would be quicker to pull his gun out. I don't think he would be quicker to necessarily kill somebody. Shane was built for the apocalypse, for sure. Oh, yeah. But mm-hmm. what I'm saying is... I think if there's a spectrum of police officers, that Rick is on the Andy Griffith side. Yes. Oh, well, yeah. And Shane is on the Dirty Harry side. I think Shane would be what we see a lot of very guns drawn. I don't know that he would be quick to pull the trigger and just take somebody out willy-nilly. I just think he would be quicker to assess a threat, a threat existed. And I think there's a dis, there's subtle distinction between what you're saying. Because you're saying he's flat out dirty Harry. He's shooting citizens of Kings County left, right, and center. I don't think he's that. I think he's definitely quicker to be suspicious than Rick is. Mm-hmm. But I don't think he's just popping caps in people left, right. Well, I don't, yeah. I mean, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that he's doing that left, right, and center. I am saying, though, that his emotions have shown to make him not necessarily think before he does something. Yeah. That's the point. I get you. And I I would say that just judging on their behavior, that Shane probably had an upbringing closer to Merle and Daryl. Yep. Than Rick's did. Very true. All right, so moving on, Rick goes back to his car. It is still number 134. And he gives a walkie to Morgan, tells him, you know, put it on this channel at dawn and we will meet up once you get everything taken care of, etc. And at this point, he sees one of his little cop buddies coming up zombified on the other side of the fence and he goes to shoot him. So there's this thing floating around the internet that when Rick kills his first zombie, who is this zombie coming up right here, that there is a sound effect that sounds like the achievement unlocked noise that happens when you're playing games on the Xbox. 
And also, a lot of fans have speculated that Rick never woke up from his coma and the achievement noise could be proof. So Marshall and I both listened to this episode. We did it with headphones in all the way up. Neither one of us could hear the sound. What I did hear is that the zombie grabs onto the fence as he's being shot and makes this, like, cha-chink noise. And that kind of sounds like it, but it doesn't sound like it. Yeah. Makes me wonder if somebody who thought that had their kid brother playing Xbox. Right. <laughs> or, or perhaps they were watching it from their Xbox. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, yet another image from the intro. They drive past the front of the sheriff's department, and here's where it gets interesting. In this shot... It, there's nothing in front of the sheriff's department. But in the intro, there's a car upside down in front of the sheriff's department. That could be like a connection to the criminal shootout they had where yeah. the car was upside down. I don't know. But I just thought it was interesting that there was that difference because that doesn't happen in a lot of the other images. Yeah, that maybe they're just combining the, the right. images there. So we're back in with Morgan, and he's reinforcing the front door and the window. Side note, in the background, there is a very pretty black and white twall purse and band-aids on the table. Meaning that either that belonged to the people who lived there before, that purse, or it belonged to Mama Zombie. I don't know, but I thought that was kind of an interesting Maybe Morgan detail. just likes to accessorize. And this, this is a perspective you won't get on every Walking Dead podcast, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so true. First spot. <laughs> <laughs> so Morgan goes upstairs. He starts looking at pictures of his wife. And he's preparing himself to shoot her. But he can't. Yeah. He's taking out some other zombies. But he cannot shoot her. And he breaks down. And at this point, Lenny James's acting is chef's kiss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I think this is really where I got sad that we won't see Morgan for a while. Yeah. But we will. He will be back. Yeah, just to think of what that experience is like. To know your wife eventually is going to come around. And the best thing you could do for the situation is to take her out. Especially for your son. Mm -hmm. Not to have to see her like that. But you just can't do it. Yeah. So then Rick goes back to the park and he sees the zombie without legs. And before he kills her, he has a breakdown, which I think is very interesting. And he says, I'm really sorry this happened to you. Before he ends up killing her. What do you think Rick is feeling in this moment? Just the weight of the world in that sense. And I think he's starting to realize how big the event is, the, the, the pandemic event. You know, that he doesn't even know what it is yet. Nobody really knows what happened or what it is. He's like trying to find his family and along the road he sees this zombie that was the first one he really saw. If he, I don't think if he ever saw that zombie ever again, he might not have broken down as early. But because it's like, there you are again, we can't escape this. It's happened. It's taking over the world, at least his corner of the world. And so it's just, it just overwhelms him in that moment. I also feel like the, there's a big difference between him shooting this zombie and shooting the former police officer. Because as officers, yes, they grow very attached to their fellow officers, but they're also ready for them to die at any time. He's been prepared for that guy to be dead at any point. So it isn't quite as impactful to then see, even though he's never met this person, a civilian. A civilian who didn't just die, but died in pain, and it doesn't stop there. And doesn't have legs. Like, what happened? Yeah. The, the, this zombie doesn't have legs. And back to the, the officer, they definitely, without a lot of explanation, give you the idea that this was a younger officer. Mm-hmm. A junior officer to mm-hmm. him, so he really feels, he does feel for that as well. Yeah. At this point, Rick is on his way to Atlanta, and he starts trying to contact people in the car, um, on the CB. And he is able to contact people from the Atlanta Survivor Camp, and also that's the first time we see Dale's camper from the intro. So my first question here is, how do Shane and Lori not recognize his voice? Because he talks enough that Amy from the camp can hear him and hear what he's saying 
quite a bit because he says something like are you out there i'm going to atlanta you know please keep this open i'm on this frequency so he talks a bit and you can hear it yourself from their point of view what he says i can very much recognize that it's him how can Lori not who's really not that far from amy how can shane not i don't understand this that's a valid point. I didn't think about it when I was watching it, but yeah, they definitely should have. The easiest thing you do is just don't have them in that scene. Yeah. Right, yeah. That's that simple. Would have been the I, those kind of things drive me crazy when they, they're simple solutions. They should have been further into the woods or whatever, just right. out of the scene. It, mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're going to be apologetic for it, it may have been that they both believed he was dead. So when they heard it, they're like, oh, it's somebody else. Incorrect. Well, okay. Lori believed. He was dead. Because Shane told her, but Shane never saw him die. Correct. And that's a whole other can of beans. Oh. Okay, so speaking of that can of beans, Lori gets a little upset for whatever reason, goes into the tent, and Shane follows her. Just to kind of reassure her and whatever, because, you know, they're hooking up. He wears a necklace that says number 22 around his neck. And I was like, what is this in reference to? That would be his football number right that is correct he was an avid fan of football playing on his school team as number 22 which hello this reminds me of like uncle rico in napoleon dynamite where he's like man if coach would have put me into state we would have won it would have been awesome like i like i feel like maybe that (laughs) are we surprised that shane chose an activity in high school where he can hurt people and not get in trouble Hmm. Mm. good point also, you will see that Carl is wearing a t-shirt with a paw logo on it. This is a direct reference to the character of Science Dog, who premiered in Robert oh, Kirkman's yeah. Invincible comic book series. Yep. Really good connection there. All right, so at this point, Rick runs out of gas, but he's next to a farmhouse. Oh, it's the same farmhouse we see in the intro. He sees a family that has basically killed themselves and written, In Blood... God forgive us on the walls, which I find interesting because that means that the guy had to kill his family, take their blood, write it on the wall, and then kill himself. Yes. Like, no Sharpies, guys? I don't... Seriously. (laughs) Yeah. Why? And, you know, God forgive us, written in blood, do you think you're making the situation any better? Writing in blood is never a good thing. (laughs) Yeah. Go back to the Manson family, yeah. Right. So he finds a horse, and at this point, I'm super excited, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So I feel like in an apocalypse situation, you need to find either a horse or a bicycle. Because A, it's very easy to have the horse have something to eat. Although, yes, there is the danger of the zombies eating the horse. But B, a bicycle doesn't need gas, so it is very sustainable because it's powered by you. So one of those two things I feel like would be a suitable car replacement for yeah, the apocalypse. I would say the horse is good for rural areas, but as we find out, it's not so good for urban areas. Right. Roller mm-hmm. skates, skateboards, scooters, like those types of things are probably the best for uh, more urban areas as well. The horse is so happy to be out of his stall mm-hmm. because goodness knows how long he's been stuck in there that when Rick gets on his back, he like bolts. He's yep. just, like, running, you know? Oh. Okay, so just a little interjection of animal science or horse science when it comes to this situation. Horses are born, what I called born Schwarzeneggers. I used to work at a ranch camp for kids, and so we talked about this. Which means they're born super muscular, and if they're kept in their pens too long, they start going buggy. Because mm-hmm. they've got to expend all that kinetic energy in them. So that's the explanation why that horse is so happy. It's not just, just because he's free. It's because he, he's meant to run. That's kind of Pent up energy. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Rick is now outside Atlanta. He's starting to go in. So you see the road from the intro where all the cars are stopped on the highway and he's riding the horse in. From here on, we get a lot of series of intro images. We get the train tracks. We get the building with the satellite dish. We get the street with the papers, and we get the street with the bus. As he is riding the horse through, there is a building with the word Hensi. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's H-E-N-S-E on the top of it. This is a reference to Alex Brewer, who is better known as Hensi. He's an internationally recognized contemporary public artist and award-winning painter based in Atlanta, Georgia. 
It's kind of an interesting uh, point there. So then Rick sees a helicopter and he's trying to chase after it, turns the corner, runs into a walker horde who starts to follow him and the horse, falls off the horse, loses the guns. Poor horse, he gets eaten. I would like to also bring up that I am totally interested to find out what they are using as the faux horse insides because the people playing walkers, those actors are putting it in their mouth. What is it? <laughs> well, this is like way in the future, but I can attest to some things that they use for this. There's a scene in a very future episode where Rick has to bite a guy's neck. Mm-hmm. And they said, do you want raw chicken or raw pork? Uh... So, yeah, it's not exactly appetizing, whatever it is. If it's if it's actually intestines and stuff like that, right. I would imagine they're not fabricating that they're probably using like maybe pig guts right. or something like that raw but... sausage gross. stuff like that yeah. so gross one of the things that you, you mentioned here is the helicopter do we get to see any of the markings on that helicopter no because i think you actually like can see it for a glimpse i looked because i wanted to know if it's the helicopter from later on or not but i could not see i think that it's no one's said one way or the other but it's suggested that it is also the Republic's helicopter. Right. That makes sense. Rick is trying to get away. He finds a tank. He climbs inside. He thinks he's going to die. And as you're sitting there, you know what's going to happen. And you're like, that, that Rick next to you, that soldier guy. Uh, okay. And now he's awake. So Rick shoots him and blows his eardrums out because he's shooting inside a tank. By the way, just a note for people here. We all have certain hearing deficiencies. If anybody in Hollywood in the sound design departments ever hears this episode, please, enough with the high-pitched whining during these scenes. You can go very muted, Mm -hmm. totally fine. But for people like us, that kills our ears. Yeah. Don't do it. It is very painful. You don't need to inflict pain on your audience to make them feel for the characters. Agreed. So after he blows his eardrums out, he hears a voice on the radio, which seems weird to me because he just blew his eardrums out. It's going to take a little while for him to recover. So if it were me, I wouldn't be able to hear the voice on the radio. They might have done it a little muffled before it came into... Given. So anyway, we know that this is Glenn. And you know, you were talking about smart survivors. I actually believe Glenn is smart survivor number two. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, we've seen Shane already, so he kind of is number two, but Glenn really is. And Glenn is one of my favorite characters in this series. And and when you see him and Daryl especially, you realize how long ago this is, and they both look like babies. They do. You gotta love that the smart survivor number two is a pizza guy. That's just kind of cool. (laughs) (laughs) nope i totally believe that that makes you gotta move fast and you you got your roots you gotta know your roots you have to deal with crazies all the time Mm -hmm. very angry people with no backup you have to be able to get out of there fast and be adaptable i'd say yeah pizza guy totally could survive by the way when we said know your roots we weren't talking about your follicles of hair or your ancestry. We mean R O U T E S. Just for <laughs> clarification. So at the end of this episode, we have a song. And what we're going to do going forward is anytime there's a song with words, we're going to analyze why this song could have been chosen, what it relates to. This song is Space Junk by Wang Chung. And I'm going to read a little portion of it that kind of looked like it was applicable to the scene. So it says, Through the tenth dimension, to the certainties beyond, dreamily inattention and the subatomic bomb, machine that spins within me and the spirit that drives me on, Searching for an answer. Welcome to my world. It does kind of seem like it's an odd placement, but welcome to my world. As Rick is starting to finally come to grips with, oh, this is what the world is now. Mm -hmm. This is now where I'm going to be stuck, and I have to figure out a way to survive in it. Right. So to play this kind of new wave-ish thing, basically kind of about disorientation. That's kind of where Mm. Rick is at. Now, the one Mm. note I will note for the future is 
this is an outlier for what comes in the future as far as music goes. Definitely. They yeah. try to stick culturally in the South from now yeah, on. Yeah, true. Whereas Wang Chung is a British band. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So that was an interesting thing. A lot, you always see a lot of interesting things in a pilot that don't always hold true for the future of a show because mm -hmm. they're just getting it started. Mm -hmm. At this point in the podcast, we were hoping to talk about people who have been killed. In this episode, there aren't really people dying that we know. So the only ones I'm going to mention are there are three criminals in a car that get shot. And also Rick's poor horse dies. Well, and Mama Zombie. I mean, that's, she's Mama just, Zombie we know who she is. Is dead, but she does not re-die. Yeah, no. Yeah, but at least she's a person of connection to people. Right. Well, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing we wanted to talk about is that we are reading concurrently the uh, Walking Dead comic book series to see what are the differences and the things that you want to take note of in the comic book series that relate to each episode. So just a couple of things that, you know, the episode is called Days Gone By, with by being spelled like goodbye. And chapter one of the volume one of the Walking Dead series is called Days Gone By. But it is still... I think it spans across many, many, many episodes of the series. It starts with Rick being shot and waking up in the hospital. But, fun fact, he has clothes at the hospital that he can change into. Well, there's stuff that's even happens before that. Lainey has already read further into it than I have, but I just started reading it this morning. And one of the differences is in the very beginning, you have a lot more establishing of the Rick Shane relationship in the show than you do in the comic, which is kind of interesting because you usually ha get less in a in a show or a movie than you do in a comic. It starts with the shootout in the comic, and on the first page, he he only gets one shot in here that takes out the chunk of his back. So it's really quick. To, it yeah, goes straight it really from is. that to coma. And one of the things that, they, that they're that they well known for in this comic is really good page turners like that. Because you just, you literally see Rick shot in the bottom of the first page, second page is him in the coma. So that was definitely something of, of difference that I, I noticed. So a couple other things, you know, in addition to him actually getting clothes and wearing the clothes out of the hospital, which I think is more helpful on him. In Rick's house, there is a picture on the wall yes. that is that shows him and Lori and Carl. That picture is actually in the show, and I forgot to mention this. When he runs out of gas in the police car, there is a photograph that matches that picture that he takes and he puts in his uniform. I'm going to talk more about that in episode two or three because I feel like that was an important plot point that didn't get brought up. Yeah. But we'll get there. Also, Rick works at the Cynthiana Police Department in the comics. Another thing I thought was funny is that there is a lot of exposition that happens once Rick gets on the horse. He has an entire conversation with that with horse, horse while he's yeah. riding into Atlanta. And it is hysterical because it kind of gives you all the information you need about what happens. And, you know, he's talking to himself, but he's talking to the horse. Right. And, uh, like, she skipped over the Morgan stuff, but that actually was pretty close. Yeah, really close. For, almost verbatim to mm -hmm. what happened. Except the zombie that they encounter in the chain link fence is not an officer which i thought actually works better right in the in the season the stuff he talks about while he's on the horse is he's trying to remember good times like the, his best day or whatever and it's the day carl was born and then that makes him cry more he goes maybe it's not good to think of the best days everything else is pretty close though there is one more thing that is different in this episode and that is that he does not get trapped in a tank in the comics. He actually runs into Glenn in the street. So that is what we're going to talk about in episode two. But the first 42 pages is basically what was in the comic that applied to this episode. Mm. And that's our show. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. 
For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out.